There are a couple of things I want to talk with myself about today as I sit here in my beanbag chair that I got for $10 at Value Village. But to start with, today was supposed to be a milestone day. And I know that because I marked it in my iCal. I was marking certain milestones when I was doing the micronutrient protocol and hoping to be able to stay on micronutrients only and no psychopharmaceuticals for as long as I could. And today was the day I marked as eight and a half months with zero medications. And that would be eight and a half months on micronutrients only. And then I also marked it as 11 months since the last crisis. And I think I did that because I had some crisis-like stuff when I was in California in, I think it was late March, early April-ish. And then Yeah, so that's how it went. So eight and a half months, no medications, micronutrients only, and then adding two and a half months. So 11 months ago, there was a crisis at this point, but this isn't the way it unfolded, unraveled. What actually happened was it did unravel, and things unraveled for me in mid-October, so... October, November, December, January, February, four months ago. So I was able to do about five months on micronutrients only, but then I had a crisis at more or less eight and a half months since my last crisis. Blah, blah, blah. Lots of different days. But had I been able to do micronutrients only up until this point, it would have been eight and a half months with only micronutrients. So I marked it in my calendar and here I am arriving at that day, but like I said, it didn't happen that way. I went back on psychopharmaceuticals in mid-October of 2017. And it was a real struggle for a good three to three and a half months. And an even harder struggle than in the past. So I'm gonna delete this event now that I've talked about it, because that's not the way it happened. And I've been on Seroquel since mid-October. I'm only on 50 milligrams at night, which isn't too bad. And now I'm aiming for something different. Aiming with no aim. I'm aiming to see if taking these two Seroquel a night helps to prolong not having a relapse. And usually I have three to three and a half months of not so good times after a relapse. And then for five to five and a half months, I'm pretty well. And during that time, I'm generally really well. And then all of a sudden, eight and a half months on the dot. Since the last crisis, I have another one. And then I have three months of struggle, followed by five months or so of wellness. So that's the cycle that has been happening for a couple of years. And so I'm not explaining it well, but I'm doing a different strategy. But I just wanted to acknowledge that I did have this date as a milestone in my calendar. And then I was hoping by nine months or so that I would start sharing with people, hey, I'm not taking meds, I'm on micronutrients, yay. And that's... Not the way it happened. So I won't be doing that. I do think that a lot of people can be successful on micronutrients and perhaps one day maybe I could too, but there's a lot of situational stuff and it's a lot more complicated and I really tried to stay on the micronutrients only and it didn't work for me at this time, but I think it did work in a way because I was able to be well for five months or more on micronutrients only. And I think it was really good for my body to have that much of a reprieve from 
the psychopharmaceuticals to sort of heal because I haven't had that much time off of them for the last six and a half or so years. So that was, I think it was a success, really. And I learned a lot, as I always do. And I did have a crisis in October and I was able to avoid the hospital. So even though I wasn't on meds, I was on micronutrients, I had to put myself back on meds. I did go see my psychiatrist, but I managed to not go back to the psych ward and suffer from post-hospitalization PTSD, as I heard someone call it recently, which I would have to agree with. But then there are other factors that come in in avoiding the hospital. And I hope to blog about some of this when I have some time, but I'm going to keep with this process of journaling by video with myself. I feel like... It's helpful. But I will be talking about that through blog. And then I just erased that. Sorry me, I didn't make that milestone. And so the next crisis, if I do this whole eight month to eight and a half month calculation thing, will be mid-June to late June. So I'm going to try some different strategies around that and keep talking myself through it and see what happens. Right now, I'm living in a basement that is not a fully enclosed suite and I can hear people talking upstairs and stomping around, which might not be good for sleep. And when that crisis point hits in mid-June, I will need my sleep. I'll need to sleep 10, 12, 14, 16 hours. So it might not work for me to be in this space. So I might need to plan a different space to be, say, June 1st to October 1st. And then maybe it'll be fine because when I'm, when I'm doing well, those things aren't as bothersome. So we'll see. I have to plan better. Or I could just be like, well, I feel great now, so I won't have to adjust anything because this is a great space for when I'm well but it might not be a great space for when I'm not doing well. So we'll see. I'm headed to California and when I'm when I come back, this space might be more enclosed. There might be a door, there might be a bit of a kitchenette or something. But it still might not be the ideal space for me to be. So we'll see. And that's something I'm going to experiment with. And it looks like in my calendar here I was hoping to write a letter to some of the people who I complained to and about saying something like thank you for inspiring me to leave the medical system and leave the mental health system and its treatments and I ended up tapering and now I'm still off the meds and so even though it was a really bad experience that you were a contributing factor in etc. This is what I did and other people could do this too and you know these the benefits of this outweigh the risks of taking meds and blah blah and go on and on like that. Again didn't happen so I'm not going to be writing that letter but I still have learned a lot. I would say I've learned that what I experienced in that really bad hospitalization in April 2016 I sort of experienced the equivalent of nearly, not worst case scenario of going through a crisis, but worst case scenario of trying to navigate a crisis without going to the hospital and being in a less than ideal situation in terms of living environment, not having a full living space to oneself, and being in a room in winter, and it being really challenging and seeing Wow, it can be challenging in the hospital, it can be challenging outside of the hospital, it can be a psychiatrist that presents challenges in the hospital, or it can be being around family members and that being hard because in that state, those lower states, I'm angry, I'm confused, I'm scared, I'm sad, I'm all over the place and then that gets projected onto the people around me because they're there. Not that they're doing anything wrong per se. So that's where I've learned about 
not having those people around during a crisis, those people aren't really around if I'm in the hospital having a crisis and that's one of the benefits of being in the hospital. But then, and then having that space to have all that anger and sadness and confusion and psychosis and scariness and not project that onto the others around. That's what happens and then that eventually leads to one getting hospitalized because the other people that are around that care about me or whoever end up taking them into the psych ward and I avoided that step. But it doesn't mean there's not all this scary stuff and awful stuff going on inside that then gets projected on and I'm having to internalize that and try not to act out based on it. I might be acting out and saying things like, I can't stand the noise, the talking, the TV, trying to protect my internal and external space, but not being good at communicating my needs and my needs not making sense given the fact that this environment was somewhat okay a few days ago and then now it's not. So that's hard for other people to understand and a psych ward does create that space of understanding to some degree but of course it presents other scariness and all these beeps and phone ringing are happening and anywho um yeah so I'm not gonna write that letter though Though I did make a note of it in here. And this also shows, this is how I try to keep track of things. By putting in dates, like putting it in my calendar. June 15th, expect a crisis. A month before that, prepare for the crisis. Two weeks before that, prepare to prepare for the crisis. Which now I'm putting those types of dates in, which I didn't do last time. I did put expect a crisis, but I didn't have the prepare for the crisis part in there. So that's something new because the first time I was able to navigate a crisis without the psych ward, it was really intense, really short, and then I went off to California, which was a beautiful scenario and it made that three months of struggle time not that much of a struggle. Struggling in paradise isn't really that much of a struggle. But then coming back here... Eight and a half months later, another crisis, struggling, but in the worst case scenario, not worst case scenario, of course people could be homeless or on the streets, so many awful things. I gotta turn that ringer off. But for me, having only a room to myself as space, family members on the other side of the wall and everywhere, and don't get me wrong, I really care and love my family, care about and love. And then it being winter time, so not being able to go outside to to have space, the only other way to get out is to drive all over, spending a lot of money in gas, or go somewhere to eat, or sit at a library, where you then have to buy food and eat. So it gets expensive to the point where one may as well have an expensive rental in an ideal scenario. So I don't even know why I was talking about that. So I'm going to erase that note I made about sending that letter. And then I also made a note to thank the woman who let me know about the micronutrients. And I will still communicate with her and I still do think it's a good product, but I would probably say, hey, this is what I'm doing now and I'm trying it, taking this psychopharmaceutical still, not managing to taper off. And yeah, and also a note to Talk to somebody who wanted to make a documentary, maybe. Which I might do as well. And I'm going to add, contact that person to make a documentary to a different date. So maybe after the June crisis, if I'm able to weather it. And then after that, I'm hoping to, at some point, maybe go to, the, to California for the winter. Next year, get a more ideal space for myself in my home area and then perhaps navigate a crisis in an ideal space almost like creating my own sanctuary where there isn't external noise somehow blah 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 
So at that point, maybe a crisis won't be so bad. So I'm going to put this note to contact this person about the documentary at the end of summertime. And another reason, and I talked about this, why I'd like to not have a crisis till after summer is because I don't want to have my three and a half months of unwellness from June 15th to September 15th. That's the worst time because that will waste all the sunshine time here. And that to me is completely unacceptable. So I'm going to change this note to contact this person about the documentary, post it for end of summer, but then say maybe by end of 2019. Because hopefully I'll have a better living space, ideal living space and things by then. So that's how I stay organized in my thinking and by knowing that I always do this. I don't have to worry about like, oh, did I put that idea somewhere? And even if I put it twice or put it one date and think of it later and put it at another date, it doesn't really matter. But I shuffle things around in my calendar as a way to keep track. So that opened up a bunch of space today that I can now move other items there. And the other thing I had a note about here was throwing a coming off party. So for example, I know the Unitarian Church throws coming out parties for people and I thought it'd be cool to throw coming off parties for people who come off psycho pharmaceuticals. So I'm going to move this note to the end of August as well because I think it's an, a good idea to keep in mind if I am ever able to come off the meds and I'm not planning to try to come off these two quetiapine until perhaps perhaps end of summer and even then that might not be a good time because it's going into winter I don't know and I sort of worry that being on it for so long will cause an accumulation of stuff and so when I do come off it, it'll be worse or I could eventually go into psychosis while on this anyway. And that's what could happen in mid-June. I could still be on these two quetiapine every night and still have a crisis. And that's what I'm wondering about. Can I be on two quetiapine a night and, and avoid a crisis or delay a crisis? So... I just thought, oh, I'll put a note in May 15th, which is a month before crisis date, for something about will 2-quetiapine stop it from happening. And I already have a note here, will 2-quetiapine a day prevent it? And I'm going to add another note. Try to delay crisis until after summer so I'm going to put September 15th and then I'm even going to put or October 15th for one year without a crisis now that would be a milestone that I could even add saying, can I make it to one year without a crisis? I'm not going to put that kind of pressure on myself. I think delaying it, you know, even till like August 15th would be great. So no pressure, but it just tries to reaffirm within myself. Okay, I'm trying to make the most of the summer. So I should even put that here too. Make the most of the summer, get outside. And that's another thing too, is I think if I can be close to rollerblading territory for the summer, which right now I'm really far away from it, it will be helpful because I worked at a warehouse through part of a crisis, so I think I could learn to be kind of really in crisis and go outside and have a good time anyway. So even if I do have a crisis June 15th, 
The crisis is always bad, but that can be minimized to about 10 days. It's the fallout period of the next three months that I think, when I was in California, it was a fallout period, but I barely noticed it. And I actually probably went back into a really high state and then fell out again versus, so for example, two weeks of crisis, off to California, back into a high state, which is still part of this three and a half months of not good stuff. So back into a good place, but then hitting a wall and having a bit more of a crisis, but it not being that bad because I'm in paradise. So the, there was very few days of actual struggle. Having an ideal scenario to go through a struggle. So if I can have a sort of ideal scenario here where my home base is in the summertime, maybe it'll be sort of the closest I can get to paradise here at home and doing those things and being in my body and exercising and getting outside, not forgetting about that this time because I've done plenty of talking about all my insights. Not my insights, but this channeling. And I want to talk a little bit about that because a couple days ago I was writing a lot in the morning. Ideas for the blog, ideas for this project I'm working on with my brain twin. And then that night I did experience some really strong heartbeat stuff without the fear because I think the antipsychotics blocked that but that process was going on and it was kind of hard to sleep so it was there and I really do feel like channeling or going into contact with this other source of information is like hitting a wall and then needing to come back into the body and that can have certain consequences almost like running a marathon one's heart will be beating fast and and sweating and breathing heavy for a while even after one stops running the marathon so it's it's like going into a marathon in consciousness which is the state of flow and effortlessness and really feeling like one is understanding something and in contact with something and then after that contact stops and then that night when I lay down to rest, there's this after effect. It's not the same exactly as running a marathon, but it's still a very obvious thing. It's a very consistent thing is what I'm trying to say. If a person runs a marathon, no doubt about it, they will be breathing heavy and sweating and their heart will be pounding for several minutes after at least. Every single human being. So it's the same consistent with channeling or being in contact with this source. Writing and stuff, being in that flow and effortlessness. And then buzzing around the rest of the day, getting lots done. And then as soon as one stops that by moving about as an awake person throughout the day. Stops and lays down, there's this heartbeat, there's this return which can be like a psychosis which can be like a return from doing an illicit drug because there's a change in the inner biochemicals when we go into those states of flow and being able to access that that doesn't cause that but it is the correlate or the yeah the correlate of it I don't feel there's any causation anymore as much as correlation so I don't know if I explained that well I don't want to make this video any longer but I have a bit more to talk about so I made those notes I made a few notes about that and I'll go into that in the next video, that hitting the wall and harvesting words. And as far as the balancing brain chemistry stuff, when that happened, when I hit that wall, maybe I'll go into this in the next video. And I don't think I'll edit this, I'll, I'll just put it up 
on YouTube and put in the private playlist as I've been doing. So yeah, I have more to talk about and I will talk about it. And I have about 12 hours of work to do before I go to California in a week. Probably almost less than a week. And I have packing to do. Today I called my credit card and I get 25 days of medical insurance through it. And then I'm waiting for 27 days. So I had to extend it, which was only $3.25 a day, but a $25 minimum. So for those extra few days, 25 bucks, which is a lot better than paying $100 for the whole month. But next time, if I book a month trip, I might book only 25 days and then I don't have to worry about extra insurance. The only other thing I'd have to do is call and see how many times I can go away for 25 days if there's a max com maximum number of days in a year that can be covered. Then I also looked at a shuttle from the airport to closer to my destination. Figured that part out, I just have to book that. And then I looked at how to get to the airport. My departing airport from where I am is a really long journey, so I might have to pester somebody for a ride, at least part of the way to rapid transit. So my trip planning is going well, and part of packing, I need to go through some of the stuff that I unpacked from all my stuff. So uh, that's going to be a bit of a process. So I do have quite a few things to do and more to talk about. I'm not sure if I'll go to the store or talk about later or what I'll do. But anywho, that's video one for today. And I've been doing some videos on wellness tools that don't have me in it. And I'm going to keep going with that. Take some screenshots to make blog posts. But the content creation I'm going to do later when I have more time. I just took a break from video making to take a quick trip to the local farm market store, my favorite one, because it's so close by and there's a lot of good stuff in there. And I got six cans of lentils, well, three of chickpeas, three of lentils, and I really like this brand because there's only somehow 38 milligrams of sodium. And I think when my microbiome wasn't healthy, have happy the other day. It could have been because it was the first day I ate a can of lentils that had 300 milligrams per serving. So my gut microbiota might not have been happy with that. They might have said nada to that. Nada microbiota. So I got six cans of this. I probably only need three before I leave because there's some nights I'll be having dinner with other people. But I figured if I get three more, I can use those as sort of visual prompts to remind myself what I was eating when I get back, because otherwise I'll have no idea. And I did the same with coconut milk. I got a case from Costco, which I'm not going to use up before I go, but that way when I get back, I won't have to go to Costco to get coconut milk, which is the cheapest place to get it. You can get it on sale for $2 a thing anywhere, but at Costco it's consistently that. So I have that, and then if I leave that out where I can see it, I'll know, oh yeah, I was making rice with lentils, or hopefully when I'm in California, I can learn to make some lentil and chickpea dishes that don't require so much rice. So that's hopefully my plan. And then I also got more Indian curry, coconut curry sauce from Costco for the same reason. That way, right when I get back, I don't have to think, oh, I have to go to the grocery store. I'll have rice, I'll have lentils, I'll have sauce, and I can make food. So that will eliminate some of the stress of coming back. And that's sort of being extra prepared, but it entered in my mind to do that. And I got some spinach for tomorrow's smoothie. And then I got some okra, because I've never seen okra looking this beautiful before. And I can put it in with my rice and lentils and Indian sauce. I also got some bean sprouts. I'll do bean sprouts today. I don't usually put veggies in, but I went to a different farm market the other day and I got the most beautiful celery ever and this avocado hummus dip and carrots, and I've been dipping that to try and get a little more veggies. These are my sequential healthy steps. 
And then I got a coconut water because I've been feeling so dehydrated. I haven't had one of these in a long time. But I think the dehydration feeling partly came from losing my bowels when I wasn't feeling that good for a day. But also all of the saunaing. So between having bad guts, probably from that can of lentils that had so much sodium, and also doing saunaing, I was feeling quite dehydrated, and my I can feel it in my skin. It's kind of ouchy and dry. So I'm gonna drink that. And now I'm on my way back home, and I have a million things to do. And to go with that, I didn't take any tyrosine today, or really look at the blue light because of have so much to do and that drives me and I don't need extra dopamine. Now I'm having some dinner. I made brown rice and chickpeas and Indian sauce and bean sprouts. And I'm just realizing I forgot the goat cheese. I have a little bit left to use up. So maybe I'll put that in my next dose because I have more in the pot. And I'm going to take some sunflower lecithin because that's one of the things that Peter Smith of Balancing Brain Chemistry says that one can take to be a bit more calm. It's an anti-manic remedy. And when I was unpacking some of my stuff, I found my stash of old vitamins that I had before I left for California. And I found this bonus bit of sunflower lecithin, which isn't expired. And here's the other bottle I already had. So I'm going to take some of these. Because I'm finding that I'm feeling like I'm very functional and able to do a lot and I think getting a lot done will create enough dopamine for me so I haven't taken the tyrosine the last two days I might have taken rhodiola today and polygala I didn't really use the blue light Yesterday I took extra zinc. I forgot about the sunflower lecithin, but I took the zinc. I took an extra dose of taurine and glycine. And I took melatonin and can't remember what else, but I am learning to bury these things. That's why it's maybe not a good idea to do the whole weekly supply. But I do know what most of them look like now. And... So I could get away with doing that and just pick the ones out that I don't want to take and add ones that I do. But I wouldn't suggest that at first because some of them look the same and then you waste a whole day's worth of stuff or you could keep it for later when you are on everything again. And I'll finish my dinner and then I'll talk a little bit more. So I'm not sure what I want to talk about now. After my last video I felt like I still want to talk about a lot more. But I don't know how much more there is. One thing I did want to say is that I've noticed I've been doing this weird gesture lately the last few days. I've been going and at first, I didn't think anything of it. And then, after I did it a couple more times, and it's spread out, it's not every five minutes, it's more like every hour or so. 
it arose in my mind that maybe it's some kind of mild tardive dyskinesia, which can happen with some kinds of psych meds. I think particularly antipsychotics, and I am taking 50 milligrams of quetiapine a night, which isn't very much. But when that hit me, that maybe it's a little bit of tardive dyskinesia, I felt a little bit freaked out because I don't know how it starts, if it starts with mild gestures. Because a lot of times it's associated with uncontrollable movements of the mouth. And I really don't know why I'm doing that. So I'm wondering if it has anything to do with it. And I don't know if tardive dyskinesia happens when first taking a med or after taking it for months or years or it's a bad reaction and then it never goes away because usually it doesn't go away. So if it's something that builds slowly over time and then is worse and worse and then won't ever stop, I need to be careful because I don't want to have these involuntary movements of the mouth. And maybe it's not that. Maybe it's from being dehydrated and then there's that gesture to sort of moisten the lips or something. I don't know, but I'm going to be aware of that because I've never been on antipsychotics for this long, even at this small a dose. So I will be careful. And I found a study abstract about the blue blocker glasses related to bipolar disorder. And I have these ones by Uvex. I got them on Amazon Prime. And I've been trying to wear them more to combine this with the total darkness therapy. And I finished setting up my darkness therapy blind. And tonight, when I get into bed, I will see if it blocks out all of the light. I highly doubt it will. Light is very sneaky. It's much like water. It's hard to keep it out. If there's a crack, it will shine through. And so, yeah, I'll figure that out. But after making this video, I'll take off my bit of mas mascara and wear these. And the study is titled Dark Therapy for Bipolar Disorder Using Amber Tenses for Blue Light Blockage. I think amber tenses are glasses, I don't know, but... It says in the abstract, and it's in the journal Medical Hypotheses, February 2008. I can't see the authors here. Anyway, it says dark therapy in which complete darkness is used as a mood stabilizer in bipolar disorder, roughly the converse of light therapy for depression or the converse, has support in several preliminary studies. <clears throat> Although data are limited, darkness itself appears to organize and stabilize circadian rhythms, yet ensuring, ensuring complete darkness from 6 p.m. to 8 a.m., that's 14 hours, the following morning, as used in several studies thus far, is highly impractical and not accepted by patients. However, recent data on the physiology of human circadian rhythms suggests that virtual darkness may be achievable by blocking blue wavelengths of light. A recently discovered retinal photoreceptor whose fibers connect only to the biological clock region of the hypothalamus has been shown to respond only to a narrow band of wavelengths around 450 nanometers. Amber-tinted safety glasses, which is what these are, which block transmissions of these wavelengths have already been shown to preserve normal nocturnal melatonin levels in a light environment which otherwise completely suppresses melatonin production. Therefore, it may be possible to influence human circadian rhythms by using these lenses at night to blunt the impact of electrical light, particularly the blue light of ubiquitous television screens by creating a virtual darkness. 
One way to investigate this would be to provide the lenses to patients with severe sleep disturbance of probable circadian origin. A preliminary case series to investigate this would be to provide the lenses to patients with severe sleep disturbance. Oh, I already read that. A preliminary case series herein dis demonstrates that some patients with bipolar disorder experience reduced sleep onset latency with this approach, meaning they can go to sleep faster, suggesting a circadian effect. If amber lenses can effectively simulate darkness, a broad range of conditions might respond to this inexpensive therapeutic tool. So, it's cool to find a study that talks about that. And the other things I want to talk about. Oh, I got to use my neti pot for the first time because it was all packed up and I unpacked it. So my nasal pas passages feel a bit better. And... Yeah, so I will read what I wrote before I hit the wall the other day. I was writing quite a few insights, and this will be a little clunky because I haven't read these types of things for a long time. But part of the point of this being is that I was down and out for months, and I could barely take care of myself. I wasn't thinking of anything interesting or there were no insights coming to me it was hard enough just to brush my teeth or shower and now it's totally different so it's so strange how executive functioning can go down to next to nothing and then it comes back and what's that all about I don't know. But this is what I wrote. I was writing about this forum that I created with my brain twin. And it's a little description. And it says, this forum is devoted to harvesting, harnessing. Let me try that again because I don't want to edit this. A forum devoted to harvesting, harnessing, and grounding the human potential that comes out of extreme states of consciousness that are currently labeled as mental illnesses to provide a platform and scaffolding to empower, change, and create the conversation that happens between peers regarding these experiences in hopes that this dialogue will ripple outward to affect the way we are approached, received, and treated upon falling out of high states of non-self that gifted us access to this energy and information in hopes that they will assist us to recollect the necessary parts of the functioning ego in order to bring back the insights and visions we have collected to manifest our individual and collective dreams and creations in actuality for the betterment of human and Gaia which are two sides of the same essence. That's a really long sentence. So I wrote that. And it's pretty much bipolar craziness. It's something that someone in the height of mania would think up. And it just sort of came to me. I just wrote it. I didn't think about it at all. And I'm not saying, oh, that's good or anything. And it, I went on to say... Perhaps the dialogue will change the field such that we are swarm sufficient in creating this capacitance within the neighborhood of people to address extreme self-care and wellness, particular to this tribe slash swarm of beings, creativity, non-rigid spirituality, and finding creating meaning through dialogue and wondering. Also inviting our neighbors, people who get it without having a label, to join in humbly. 
because it's hard to stay humble when one connects to that energy. And then I went on to write other stuff that morning and then that was the night that I kind of hit the wall, which is how I like to word coming back, returning to, I don't know what kind of consciousness, regular consciousness, and it's a bit of a hangover and it's a bit of a detox process. Just like how alcohol wears off, mania wears off too. And so I tapped into it temporarily. And so I also, I'll talk about a few of these insights or whatever the hell, because I haven't for a really long time. And nothing's really occurred to me anyway, but I was thinking about how before I've talked about how we're often warped by how others see us or look how they're looking at us, the light from their eyes. And it, it occurred to me that it's sort of similar to how I've gotten okay at singing certain songs with myself alone in my car. And I can belt them out and sound okay. Of course, the music is playing, which makes me sound a little better than if it wasn't. But if I were to stand in front of 10 people and try to do the same thing, I wouldn't be able to sing as well. So mania, when one is in it and not being warped and sort of in one's own world, wandering around as one's best self is like being able to sing that song really well alone in one's car. And then as soon as others come in and are sort of looking, just that process of being observed by others makes us perform differently, makes us act differently, makes us sound differently. Some people might be really confident talking to their best friend one-on-one, -on -one, but then you put them in front of a group and they can't say anything or they're afraid. So it's the same with this energy of so-called mania. So can we learn to be this best self in front of others? because we often revert back to being who they think we are. Which is, other people might think that I can't sing that song. So then, when I try to sing in front of them, I can't. So, yeah, I don't know what that even really means, but... And... Then Okay, this is another one I wrote. Because another thing I ponder about is what is the function of this change in consciousness for people who connect with this other algorithm of operation that isn't yet really grounded. I wrote, we have a different function to show what's possible, to show, to show our whole belief structure can radically change, mutate, to show that belief is outmoded by direct understanding that unfolds as radically apparent in each moment. Belief is brain damage, a recorded program of which gets superimposed on a new moment, thus makes it old. We can show that this mutation changes our experience and thus our ref our reality manifests for us. And that's how our reality manifests for us. With enough people grounded in this, the world will change. Heal the world from the inside out.
And then I was thinking about mania in terms of post-traumatic growth. So, in my experience, I experienced psychosis, which is very traumatic. And dis dissociation, depression, all of this is trauma. And then out of that comes a mania, which could be seen as post-traumatic growth if psychosis, dissociation, and depression are seen as trauma, as being in a traumatized state, as processing old trauma, as reliving it, re-experiencing it, and having it mess up the executive function. And then there's a post-traumatic growth after that. So I'm not saying it necessarily is post-traumatic growth, but if one is seeing that psychosis and dissociation have to do with trauma and it is traumatic and psychosis is very traumatic in terms of the pendulum swing mania could be a bigger post-traumatic growth than what is typically seen and that is one of the reasons why so many ecstatic traits come out of it so it's almost like going into trauma and then having a big post-traumatic growth. Going into trauma, having a big post-traumatic growth. Versus some people who are going along their lives and then maybe have a trauma and then have post-traumatic growth and then they normalize and even out and they don't necessarily have post-traumatic growth again. Whereas in bipolar, it seems like that cycle keeps repeating. And I also wrote that in bipolar, we make up terms that are congruent with our experience. We make up a lot of words and metaphors and poetry. And I talked about, at least I think I talked about how Ron Unger, in his course about CBT for psychosis, talked about how when we don't quite have words for what we see, we speak in metaphors, and I think that's why in mania we often speak in metaphors because we can't quite put to words what it is we're perceiving. So we can say it's like, it's as, but we can't really quite say what it is. And one of the reasons we can't, too, is because other people can't see it and experience it, so we haven't really made words to point to that reality, made congruent words. So in bipolar, we often make up terms that are congruent with experience, as well as speaking metaphors and poetry. So for example, whoever created the word chillax, why don't you chillax, which is chill and relax, but it has a little bit different connotation then chill or relax. Somebody put it together. So people do have a tendency to do this, make up new words that are a bit more congruent to a certain experience or meaning. But with bipolar people, we do this a lot, a lot more. So we have this process augmented and we create new words at a much greater frequency, but I think it's because we're perceiving something new. So if there was a new item created in the world, somebody would give it a name. Nobody creates something and doesn't name it. So then when we're perceiving something really subtle, practically unseen, we would create a new word for it. So for example, I heard that in some indigenous 
cultures that live in snowy areas, they have like 10 or 20 words for snow. Whereas we call it snow. We might call it powder versus packed, which relates to skiing and snowboarding, but we don't have that many words for snow. But because they perceive more and more subtleties about the snow because they're in contact with it so much. So I feel like in bipolar we're in contact with this unseen dimension and we're in contact with it so much and so deeply that we can't help but try to create words to describe it so then others can see it too. So the cultures with 20 words for snow, the people that understand that culture and live in it would understand what each word for snow points to, something different. So, and that's the other thing, we see that the current vocabulary isn't adequate enough to describe this new way of experiencing. And in a point I made before, the new way of experiencing is not having any beliefs. And the thing is that gets confusing is we can operate with no beliefs for a certain period of time, but then when believing starts coming back online, it gets really confusing because I think at first it's mixed with believing. And then since the real state is more creating how the world works for us versus believing how it works, which is a static thing. When this, when we're not able to move so quickly and sharply and fluidly that we start believing something, making it static, and then superimposing it on reality, that's when it gets confusing. But that process is what reinitiates for us, for our brain to start working in terms of belief, which is a lot slower because it involves remembering from the past, either explicitly or implicitly in the process of perception, perceiving and superimposing that belief, which happens so fast we don't even know that we're doing it. We don't know that we got that from the past or somebody else. So, And then I made a note to write a book about what it's like to perceive as a bipolar person, not about behavior. And I'm sure people have done that, but I feel like it really could be unfolded a lot more. They talk about bipolar as a behavioral disorder but that's somebody observing it from the outside. Whereas from my perspective, I would say it's a change in the perceptual algorithm, which leads to a different way of acting, of course. And then I wrote down that psychosis is more powerful for processing repressed information than bad moods. And psychosis and dissociation eventually go to bad moods. And the reason I wrote that is because in my recent crisis, I didn't really have that much psychosis. And in the past, that's been more of the prominent feature of when I have a crisis. So, I was wondering if my bipolar disorder with psychotic features is, the psychotic features is waning. And what I had more this last crisis was bad moods. And I couldn't control it. I was grumpy, I was sad, I was all bad moods. And it wasn't fun to be in a bad mood and not be able to really change it, except 
acted out in projecting on others around me or internalizing it. I feel like the more the times that I've had really powerful psychotic experiences, the experience has been a lot quicker. And that's why I wrote psychosis is more powerful for processing repressed information than bad moods. And not necessarily consciously processing it, like thinking it through. It's like having a super bad dream and dreams help to process information that we're sort of unaware of. I feel psychosis does the same sort of thing, but it's not rational. So, for example, I'll have a really intense psychosis for three days. Things don't make sense. Crazy stuff going on in my brain. Laying there, experiencing the craziness. Then it's over, and I taper off the extra antipsychotics, and then I kind of just go on with it. And some of the times I don't even experience depression. I think I have once or twice but most of the time it's a powerful psychosis and then I kind of get on with it whereas this time I didn't really have much of a psychosis but I had all this depression and bad moods and suicidalness so I feel like I was experiencing more of what it's like to be more I don't know classically bipolar which is up and down mood Whereas mine is probably hypomania-ish, psychosis, a little bit down, but not up and down and being moody all the time. I'm usually perfectly fine, psychotic for a while, but I didn't really experience moods and projecting that on people. And I think that's worse. I think I'd rather have a short psychosis than this long, drawn-out drama with people wasn't fun at all and psychosis isn't fun either but at least it makes no sense and then it's over and then it can just be forgotten about whereas the bad moods it's like ooh, it just bad interactions bad everything that just leaves a bad taste in everyone's mouth so i think and i wrote that Psychotic features lower over time as one gets good at not believing them. So I've gotten really good at not believing anything psychosis related. So I think it might not even bother to come up as much anymore because I don't believe it anyway. Because there has to be some level of believing it or buying into it to even have it arise. Because it's energized by fear. And part of the fear is in believing it. So I feel like by dismantling the belief around it, it dismantles the fear and then prevents it from popping up. I don't know if that's true, I'm just wondering if that could have something to do with why I didn't really have that much psychosis. And I also wrote, we go into unknown territories of human potential To see that we potentiate our beliefs. And soon our beliefs will be fluid just like our brain cells. And the pendulum swing and feeling higher highs and lower lows than normal people. So I'm I'm pretty sure I wrote somewhere that, and I don't know where, I sort of realized that it's a state of suspended beliefs where we can kind of try on new beliefs. I feel like the universe and Gaia is putting us into a state of suspended beliefs, so that new, not beliefs, but a new algorithm of functioning that isn't beliefs will take hold or take root. 
sort of like finding the right seed. And then if that takes root in some, then it will spread to others. I don't know, it's, it's kind of complicated. And then I compared my little thinking that having laryngitis could have something to do with singing better to a doctor making the connection to, or of hand washing and women dying at childbirth as necessary and that took like a hundred years for people to adopt and then once they did women stopped dying so it was seen as crazy so no one believed it but we don't know but then with what I've said before it could be also that we can individually create our own beliefs and it doesn't necessarily matter what other people believe or we fall in, a, in alignment with what the con consensus believes. And I think part of the trouble is we're programmed to believe what we're told and not find out for ourselves in general. Oh, and <clears throat> I wrote, when we solve a problem, we leave it alone and come back to it later. Not all the time, but sometimes. And this other state of consciousness, which I've called map consciousness before, it's sort of like solving a problem. So we go into this mania state of consciousness to solve a problem. And we're not able to solve it when we're there. We're not able to solve this new way of being. We're not able to figure it out. We're not able to stay in that ecstasy. And then we fall out of it. But then we go back to it later. So often, most often people go back into that state at another time. So I feel like the human being will always go back to that state of trying to resolve human problems. Its own personal problems. The world's problems. That's what we try to do when we go into that state. Even if it's confused and sort of sideways. The funny thing is that when we're in that state, we often feel like we have to save the world. We're on a mission to save the world. And we might have some ridiculously silly scheme, yet we actually believe it's going to help the world. Or it's meant to help the world. But really what that could be pointing to metaphorically and what we're believing, because we're still sort of stuck with that sense of believing something. It could really be trying to tell us that this is a problem-solving state. That we're trying to solve a problem. The brain is, not us personally. The human brain. Because we all share the same collective content of consciousness if I say something someone else knows what it is because we all share in that consciousness and that shared consciousness is creating a certain trajectory of the earth and the world that is not good so some people go into a different state of consciousness and it's the trouble too is we think it's personal we take it to be personal because we take our life to be personal and then that's when we translate us being in a state of trying to solve human problems we translate that into I'm saving the world or I'm gonna save the world so the problem solving state correlates or extrapolates at the human behavioral level into us trying to create some kind of scheme to help the world. When it's the state itself and we don't necessarily have to do anything. It's the doing things at the human level that likely gets in the way of what it is this altered state of consciousness 
is is trying to do. It's hard to really talk about, but for me, for example, I feel like I have a lot of what happens to people in mania in some sense of order because like I'll have that energy of consciousness, but I won't go and spend all my money thinking that I'm going to create something that's so great because I don't translate that energy into the human behavioral level so much. I might buy, I might have a tendency to buy a little bit more and I am trying to create something, but I don't try to create some very particular thing. I do in some sense, but I don't try to do it all at once. I get some parts of it done and then I fall out of it and then I get a bit more done and I fall out of it. So I'm creating something big perhaps. I don't know what it is. I create a bit of it each time but I don't try to create some big standalone thing. Put all my eggs in that in one so-called mania. And I think too since so much of the energy gets translated into dialogue and seeing and thinking in new ways, which is part of what I think the brain is trying to do, because what we need to do is see and think in new ways in order to solve these problems, not think in old ways. So. The brain goes into seeing and thinking in new ways, but our human doingness, our dopamine hit, goal setting, accomplishment, I can do something level, or even a lot of that energy gets translated into hedonism, gambling, sex, so many things. And, um, None of that interests me at all. So I think if we translate that energy into I'm so great, I'm doing all this great stuff, and then hedonism, it really wastes it. And, you know, that might, and that's part of it too. The brain is entering into a problem solving state. And we either try to create schemes to help the world, solve the world's problems, which the problem is the human brain cells themselves and the way they're operating. So unless we let that really take root and sit with it and wonder and ponder, then we just translate that energy into accentuated current human behaviors. So then if we're not doing the scheme to create a better world, then what we do is I'm going to solve the problem better of getting more and more pleasure. I can get it even better than anyone else. And I'm going to feel more and more pleasure with all these human pleasurable things that were programmed to divert our energy to with entertainment in all these different ways, shopping. So a lot of the bipolar energy, I feel, just gets translated into augmenting the things that we're programmed to do with our time and money. But amplified because we have more energy so we put more energy into those things we've been programmed to do which that's what leads to the fall not the only thing but there's got to be a different way can we stay with the energy to allow it to work in the brain and not do stuff. And then I wrote, last night when I was falling asleep, I realized that the current operation of the human brain, pleasure more cannot be sustained by the earth. Well, duh. The current human belief structure cannot be maintained. So it's our belief structure 
that underlies this more pleasure, blah, blah, blah. So what is happening when people go into altered states is, is that they are in a state where those beliefs are suspended and new ones can be tried out to see if something works or takes root. A new human being with new belief structure is necessary or perhaps no belief superimposed upon what is, but seeing what is and acting. And then I wrote, whatever we do with technology sets an intention with the universe of what we want to do ourselves. So that could be related in a way to what I was saying in that we have an idea and then we create a rocket ship because we want to go into space And then we do that as a humanity, and then it's telling the brain cells they want to go into space, so some people do kind of go into space. I don't know what I'm trying to say. I guess in a way, how much human energy and consciousness and brain capacity it takes accumulating that all into one equation and calculating it. That's a lot of energy to create that rocket to send somebody into space. But imagine if that same amount of energy was put into inner space. What might we be able to do without creating any kind of external representation of that desire and then when I was saying that just now I was thinking think of the technology that scientists and anthropologists and whoever says that the Mayans and the ancient cultures must have had in order to create some of the things that they did or you know they lived in these beautiful structures but there wasn't much there but maybe they didn't eat much because they could have any experience inwardly that they ever wanted. But then something shifted at some point and we wanted to create all those on the outside. And so now, instead of being humans on the earth and the earth doing its thing and all that energy and humans living quite inwardly rich now we've switched and all of that we've tried to create outward manifestations of and thus we are stripping the earth of all its resources and ruining the whole biosphere and and I think as this happens more and more more and more of us are going to be depressed and and psychotic and inwardly very barren and then at some point we'll make the switch back and go inward the earth will replenish itself blah 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 I don't know I'm just making all this stuff up because that's what my brain is doing right now and yeah and then I wrote some possibilities for writing blog posts and yeah, so my brain is back operating the other way. Wanted to talk to myself about this stuff, and now I have, and I have other stuff to do. I feel like I've gotten somewhat more organized in my office today. I had a bunch of stuff all over my desk and all over this back area here, and little bits and pieces, and I went through them, and I put them somewhere. It might not be where I want to put them. For sure, but I don't have time to think too much about that because I'm going to California. So I'll share a little bit of what I did. I did take a tyrosine this morning because when I woke up I was feeling a little bit of depression. So I think by taking the lecithin and not taking the tyrosine, not doing the blue light, not doing uh, whatever... I felt a little bit of depression, so 
I thought to myself, today I'm going to go back on the tyrosine. Because he said only skip a day or so anyway. And so I'm feeling more creative too. I just thought of some creative stuff that I actually need to write down before I talk about all this that I did. And yeah, that's kind of it. So I'll go through it kind of quickly here. This is my video update on what I've created so far in terms of creating my own space that is devoted to wellness as well as making meaning, spirituality, creativity, and alternate perspectives of extreme states of consciousness. And this stems from having a diagnosis of bipolar disorder and making a space that is congruent with that way of perceiving and being. I won't go into that too much right now, but I'll go through some of the stuff that I have. And one day I'd like to make a similar space that is open to people like me, where they can come in and explore extreme wellness and the other things that I mentioned. And then once one is recharged, one can then reach out in altruistic ways. Because a lot of times with bipolar, we're trying to save the world in some regard, even if it seems ridiculous at times grandiose, or we have schemes that aren't even close to what's going to do the job. And also we think we can do it all ourselves, or we try to recruit people in crazy ways. So I feel that might one day be able to be put in perspective in its rightful place, but it's good to be able to have a space designed to support wellness because a lot of times when we go into those creative endeavors, we neglect our bodily wellness and we go more and more into ideas and insights and meaning making. So there's a balance and I'll go into that later, but first and foremost, my big comfy couch. I picked this because you can, you can spoon on it. You can lay two people very comfortably. You can sleep on this couch. It's not a pullout, but it's very, very comfortable to the point where Sometimes I'll sleep on it just because it's so comfortable instead of sleeping in my bed. And then have a bunch of blankies in this for now. And I have one of these hula hoops, but I can't spin the other way, so I haven't really used it in a while. And my mini trampoline, love this. It exercises every single cell in your body. And I have my yoga mat set up right now in front of the TV in case I want to do yoga. And I put all my posture and rolfing books out here because it's related to that. And this thing is for balance. And a meditation cushion, one of those foam rollers for rolling out your muscles, and a spunk or a Himalayan acupressure mat. This thing stretches your calves. And then I have a bunch of smaller things that you can't really see, but it's a skipping rope, different sizes of weights, ankle weights, hand weights, those squishy things to strengthen your forearms, and who doesn't want to have a thigh master from winners? And I want more of these bands, but I think I broke the other ones. DVD player, a Blu-ray, Apple TV, and essential oil diffuser. I love this thing. And these are all my wellness knickknacks that I haven't gone through yet. They're sort of like spiritual thingies or... See all these yogi teas have these positive sayings. So lovely stuff like that, which I'll probably go through this afternoon. And then I have this big old TV. It's a projection TV. And, and I don't really watch enough TV to justify buying a TV. So I'm fine with this thing. I'd probably just have no TV if I decided to stop packing this thing around. And this chair is really good for doing a psoas muscle exercise that I do. I can show that later, but it's 
got no sides on it and it you kind of bend over this way and exercise your obliques and stuff and your psoas and then I'm gonna put a lot of plants down here and I love this statue a lot of times I don't like the look on the Buddha's face but this one I like so I got it and more plants that I need to set up and a chair for sitting outside and that's outside another chair and then I have this big old computer that may or may not work very well, but I'm gonna set it up probably in the corner there and have it as a music creation station and see if I'm at all excited to get back into that. I can't do it very well, but I think if it's right by the window, I'll be tempted to sit there and play around with it. But if it's in a corner against a wall, I won't sit there. So that's my idea there. And I have a MIDI keyboard, which is in this thing. I won't open it up, but see? And these, I'm not sure where I'm going to put them. I might put one of them over here with some of the knickknacks. Or I might put the knickknacks away and have this space more zen. But I do like to have things out and visible because that's how my brain operates. It operates based on seeing something. So if it's time to utilize something and there's a hundred things on, on the wall there in the cabinet, my brain will pick that thing out and I'll go right to it. And that way I don't have to think about something. I don't have to abstract. I only have to act. So I'm gonna see if I wanna put them in drawers or put them out and I might do a combination or if they all fit in the drawers and I'm fine with that, I'll put these somewhere else and do something with it. This is all my kitchen stuff and I don't have a kitchen. And I might have a bit of a kitchenette at some point. So that's all of that stuff. But, you know, I have this old juicer that I got from a lady who passed away. She died at like 96. So she knew what she was doing. But then I also have a Breville juicer that was partially gifted to me. I have a fruit ice cream maker, Yo Nana's, and I have a food processor. And I have my high power blender that I am using that's upstairs in the kitchen. Those are some of my favorite kitchen appliances. I do lean towards raw veganism. And if I ever did have a shared space, I'm sorry, it would be vegetarian. Meat is not my forte, and I don't want to smell it, see it, touch it, have it touching other things. It's not necessary anymore. And then put this cabinet here because there's no closet to the outside and put my outside jackets and sweaters in it. And then I piled up my shoes here. So some things are obviously mine, but it'd be cool if one day I had a space that was mine with my stuff that was mine, and then the rest was shared in some way and also this is my office and it's purposefully very visual and open i like having everything so i can see it as much as possible i need to sort through those boxes and then um i have some old vitamins there creativity stuff electronics food, which would go in the kitchen, and this little music-y thing that I'm not sure where I'm going to put yet. But these are some ideas for keeping things very visual. Here I have stuff visually, bags and bags and stuff for summer and a big blow of floaty, and then sporty stuff like snowboarding goggles and cones for rollerblading, cords. I need to go through these cords actually because I went through a bunch of cords. Ooh. And I thought I went through cords that I had in this mess here. And I gotta go through those. And these extension cords, batteries, stuff to camp, roller blades. More camping stuff because I have this fantasy about living off the grid, but I've never fulfilled it. More stuff. I'll do the rest later.
these boxes I gotta sort through. It's full of resources and I want the shelf to be all resources related to mental health and alternatives and then really healthy stuff like DVDs and then my book collection, which I like a lot and other stuff to sort through and then different media and supplies like office supplies and more over there, my vitamins, store stuff this way too. Again, all very visual. And then I tend to know exactly where everything is. And this cabinet, I have to go through everything in here because it's just a bunch of like, tools and random wellnessy bits. And the bathroom, which has some cool stuff in it. And sleeping with the amber glasses and earthing mat, earthing sheet. So I just organized all my knickknacks, wellness tools, sen sensory modulation stuff. And I'm feeling pretty good about my level of organization now in my space. There's a lot more to do, but I'll leave that for when I get back. So now I'm going to do some high intensity interval training on my elliptical three rounds going all out and then I'll probably have some veggies and dip and then I'll have a shower and then I'm probably gonna go to Dollarama and get a few things and then after that I'm gonna start packing and I have a couple more things to do for my job and then I think it'll be pretty smooth sailing so I'm, I'm glad about that.
I did all that, and now it's time for a snack. I have avocado hummus, carrot sticks. I have avocado hummus, carrot sticks, and celery. I like the light celery. And I bought some okra yesterday, AKA ladies fingers, because they look so fresh and good. I'm gonna see what it tastes like in this dip. Mmm, that's really good. Okra is gelatinous like aloe, so it's really good for you. Also like chia seeds. I'm leaning over so you don't see my nipples. See? Tomorrow I'm gonna make a smoothie with pumpkin, canned pumpkin, cinnamon, vanilla powder, dates, walnuts, maybe some organic oats, coconut milk, that might be it. So now it's time to shower and get ready for the day, even though it's three o'clock. 